Okay, so welcome to another edition of the Pro Longevity podcast. And today I'm delighted to welcome uh, someone I've known and followed for a very long time. I've read her, some of her books, I've followed her blogs. Uh, we've met through the Public Health Collaboration, Zoe Harkham. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's a delight. Um, and to give a little bit of background, because Zoe and I know each other ra rather well, and in our community she's well known, but outside our small world perhaps not. So Zoe is a researcher, she's an author, she's a blogger, and a fantastic public speaker in the sort of field of diet and health. And her particular areas of interest are public health, especially dietary guidelines, nutrition and fat, and, and the relationship with obesity. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that in some detail. She's got a BA and an MA from Cambridge University, so a brain the size of a planet. And uh, not so long ago, actually, in 2016, she was awarded a PhD in public health nutrition. And the thesis title was An Examination of the Randomised Controlled Trial and Epidemiological Evidence for the Introduction of, of Dietary Fat Recommendations in 1977 and 1983, a systema Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. Just trips off the tongue. <laughs> I'm glad um, you said I that. I think the point, the point about you, Zoe, is I think that all sounds very intellectual and very complex. And where I think you're so remarkable is um, your reviews are unbelievable. Um, I learned so much from you, but your ability to turn all that complexity into something lay people can understand and even the occasional pharmacist is, is quite remarkable. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> so thank you once again for joining us. I know you're really busy and I think this is at least your second uh, Zoom of the day uh, podcast. So uh, I thought we might start by just discussing a little about your own background and your ac academic history. OK, I mean, it was actually at Cambridge that all of this started fascinating me and it made no sense that we had obesity at any kind of level and it was starting to take off. Um, so 80s, 90s, um, a, a problem that we'd never previously seen. My mum didn't see it. Our grandparents didn't see it. Um, it started to take off and it, it just didn't make sense. I've never met anyone who wants to be overweight, let alone obese. Um, you can be OK with your size and you can accept the size that you are. But that is different to being OK with it. And if yeah. somebody were to give you a magic pill and to say, OK, you're now going to be a size eight or 10 or 12 or whatever you want to be that's in female sizes I don't know anyone who wouldn't take that pill to be quite honest and I know people who hate dieting but they go through this incredible pain on a repeated basis because the perceived reward is just so great so I'm a mathematician by background I did I did the entrance exam into Cambridge on maths I switched to economics when I was there so that was sort of more big problem solving um and it's just a conundrum to me and I've been fascinated by it ever since. So to understand obesity, you have to understand when it started. And if you look back at the UK, we've got some great data um, before we would devolve. So we had the four nations as part of the UK. Obesity in 1972 for both men and women was 2.7%. And then by the end of the last millennia, it was 25.8% for women. And I think it was 22.6% for men. So, in, so basically, we've seen a tenfold increase yeah. in a generation or two. Yeah. In, in fewer than three decades, yeah. So, which kind of means either something fundamental has happened to our genes in 50 years, which or we've all become very fat and very lazy in 50 years, or there's, another, or, or there's something else about it, right? Yeah. And, and, and that is the thing when people say, oh, it, it's genetic. Yes, there's a genetic element to obesity, um, just as there's a genetic element to virtually every, every other attribute of a human being. So if I had two super tall parents, I would be super tall. Um, you've got that kind of genetics going on. But you're right. In a generation, it cannot explain that explosion in obesity. And when people have looked and said, oh, it must be because we ate too much and we did too little, Actually, no, the data don't hold that up. So if you look at the calorie intake over that period, and I did in a, a book I wrote on obesity back in 2009, um, the calorie intake actually went down during that period. Um, and in many ways, exercise actually went up. I, I remember when I was knocking around on a street corner when I was a kid, if a jogger had, had gone by, we'd have laughed. We'd have stopped what we were doing. It would have been so astonishing. Um, I mean, it's just the norm now. People are out running, they're out cycling, they're going to gyms, they're in health clubs. Um, it's just the norm. We didn't do that. We just walked to school and played hockey. Or if you had a sport you liked, you did your sport. But 
we didn't do all of this obsessive, you know, I've got to do my crunches and I've got to follow, you know, I've got to do Joe Wicks or something because there's a yeah. lockdown. I mean, we didn't get fat and, you know, fat through being lazy and greedy. That This is something that Gary Taubes says so brilliantly. If you're saying that we ate too much and we did too little, you're basically saying we're greedy and lazy. And that's not very nice. And it's also not accurate. And that's what I believe as well. So you you have to look at what happened. Now, I'm really open to anyone coming up with any other suggestion. But something that did happen is that we changed our dietary guidelines. Yes. And we used to believe that carbohydrates made you fat and fat was full of fat soluble vitamins. And we kind of just turned that on its head and said, fat is now really bad. We think it causes heart disease. You must avoid it. And I guess one of my own big penny drop moments was when I realized there's only three things that we eat. So if you'd sort of draw, imagine a little pie, uh, excuse the pun, um, we only eat carbohydrate, protein and fat. And protein, take it from me, I can give you academic references if you want, but both theoretically and empirically, we eat about 15% of our diet in the form of protein. We just do. Um, it might be as high as 20%, but work at about 15%, 15, 20. Um, as soon as you then set a fat upper limit of 30%, you've immediately set a carbohydrate lower limit of 55%. And that's what we did. Back yep. in 1977 in the US, that then got embedded in the US dietary guidelines, which come out every year, sorry, every five years, 1980, 85, 90, and so on. And that has just served to reinforce fat is bad, carbs are good, especially carbs if they've got fiber, lols. Um, and we have ended up on this low fat, high carb diet. And along the way, we've also got fatter and sicker. And there are many different ways of explaining why that has happened, but just observe it as the opening point, which is something did change. As I've said, give me another explanation and I'll look at it, but that's a massive one. And until someone can disprove that as a hypothesis, I'm interested in it. So this is an obvious kind of area of interest for people in who've, who've got medical degrees or nursing, or as I have pharmacy. It's not an obvious area for someone with a degree in maths or, 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 or uh, economics. So what drew you into it? I mean, yeah, no, personally, probably my brother becoming type one diabetic when he was 13 and I was 15. And I immediately realized the difference between insulin and, and glucose. And we were trained as a family to observe when he was high in glucose and when he was high in insulin and what we needed to do. Um, so I knew that if my brother were going into a hypo, he was getting very low blood glucose because he'd taken too much insulin. Um, I knew that I had to get something into him really quickly. Um, and I knew that all that took was, um, and he was really, really bad. I can remember a time in my twenties, I lived very near him in London and he was really bad. And you just have to, he, he was on the floor at this point. We'd been watching a movie, him, him and his girlfriend and me, we just hadn't realized that he'd been going lower and lower and lower during the movie. And we got up to the end of the movie and his girlfriend said, oh, you're going to walk Zoe home now. And he just said, yes, but clearly had no idea what walking me home meant. And um, his girlfriend said, oh, you know, don't you need to put your shoes on? And he kind of looked at his feet, but he, I mean, he was just, he was not with us. Um, and then he sort of fell to the floor and you just need the tiniest amount of orange juice. Um, and you're sort of trying to pour it in and, and you just need some to touch the lips. And it's like a magic pill. It's like a defibrillator. Um, or you get a Mars bar. He would always have one close to hand. And you just smear a bit of the caramel or chocolate on his lips and he would go, to, and that's it. That's all it, it took. Um, and what that kind of thing makes you realise as well is that, and I get so mad when I see people saying this on Twitter, oh, how dare you attack sugar? My type one little child, if he doesn't have sugar, he might die. It's like, no, it's not lack of sugar that might cause your little one to die. It will be too much insulin. Yeah. But four is insulin. If you didn't put too much insulin in, it doesn't matter what carbohydrate then went in next. My brother had a hypo because he put too much insulin in. Now you can say too much insulin relative to what he then ate at dinner, but he still put too much insulin in, you know, and, and people just don't get this. So this, this, it makes you challenge this whole, you must eat carbohydrate. Well, actually you don't need to eat carbohydrate at all. Um, it, it's very interesting because we know that type ones literally wither away yeah. and they wither away because their bodies can produce no insulin. Yeah. And that means energy can't enter the cell. Yeah. And so however many Mars bars you feed them or however many calories you put inside them, yeah. 
yeah. will have absolutely no effect if you don't add insulin. Yeah. We also know that when you add the insulin, that allows energy into the cell. Yeah. And immediately someone starts on insulin, they put weight on, yeah. which tells you there's something to do, some direct relationship between insulin and weight. Yeah. What we also know is that as you add in more insulin, people's metabolic rate drops. Yeah. So we also know that insulin, just from what the fundamental basic observations of type one, insulin lets energy into cells, more insulin um, lowers energy consumption. Yeah. So this idea of um, eat a little less and move a little more, while it might not ha be without any basis whatsoever, Life is much more complicated, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, where to start on that one? One of the, I mean, you probably saw this at the, the calorie presentation, which is online. If you go to, I think it was um, 2018, public health collaboration conference. Um, and oh, yeah. one on, yeah, calories, yeah. kettlebells, whatever. Yeah. And I think um, without having the chart in front of me, I, I can probably still do this. So I take a typical female, 2000 calories a day. And people think that calories are equal, which is why they don't seem to mind if you're having 55% of them in the form of carbohydrate and 30% in the form of fat. Forget micronutrients for now. We're just looking at those big macronutrients yeah. like carbohydrate and protein. And they don't seem to realize that they have different jobs to do. And this is mostly driven by something called the basal metabolic rate. So in that typical female, 2000 calories a day, let's say she's just moderately active. She's doing something three times a week. She's not a triathlete or anything. Um, she will need 1500 of her calories in the form of um, things that can supply the basal metabolic rate. Now, they will predominantly be fat and protein because the things that are in the basal metabolic, I mean, we think of the basal me metabolic rate as if you're lying in bed all day and you've got flu and you're feeling really unwell and you don't get up, you don't move around, you've still got to do certain things. You've got to build bone density, you've got to fight infection, particularly at that time. Um, you've got to do muscle repair and cell repair and da, 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 all the other things. And you've and also got to run your brain, which consumes a totally, lot of energy. Totally. Yeah. And a great proportion of that is needed in the form of fat and protein. Now, for your other 500 calories, let's say um, she's not ill in bed, she's up and about. So she's moderately active, 500 calories. That can be supplied by either fat or carbohydrate. Now, as a last resort, if you had somebody on a really stupid diet, and I'm thinking bodybuilders here, and they're not really eating fat, and they're not really eating carbohydrate, they're just, you know, these protein shake junkies or whatever. As a last resort, the body will use protein for energy, but it really is a last resort. So let's just think fat or carbohydrate for the energy, fat and protein, mainly for the basal metabolic rate. So then when the government says have 55% of your diet in the form of carbohydrate, that's 1100 calories. So the body said... I needed a maximum of, let's keep it simple. There is some carbohydrate that can help with basal metabolic rate. It can help, but let's just keep it really simple and say, okay, the basal metabolic bit is fat and protein. The energy bit is fat and carbohydrate. So you had 600 calories more than you needed to use up for energy, but you didn't have enough. You had 400 calories too few in terms of what you had for your fat and protein. So this is how we end up fat and sick because we're eating too much carbohydrate and not enough fat and protein. And what happens when people go on a diet, so that 2000 calorie a day woman is feeling a bit overweight and wants to lose a bit, what she cuts back on primarily is fat, because the calorie theory says fat approximates to nine calories a gram, and protein and carbohydrate approximate to four calories a gram. It's not precise science at all. I go through it in that presentation and I make yeah. a few jokes out of it because um, mm -hmm. it is really ridiculous. Um, but that's the bit that they know. So they avoid fat. So they're avoiding the one macronutrient that can actually do everything. It's the one most likely to be used up by the body because it can be used for the basal metabolic stuff and it can be used for energy. It's not going to get left over at the end of the day. The body is going to use it somehow. So the woman cuts back on fat so you've got even less fat and protein combined to do your repair and maintenance work. And you didn't make any difference in terms of your energy because you're probably still at 700 calories of carbohydrate, which is still more than you needed. Yeah. So people think, how could I ever? You know, people say, just eat less, forget the do more, just eat less, you will lose weight. No, you could cut back 500 calories a day of fat and protein, cut back 500 calories a day of carbohydrate, and you've still eaten too much for what your body actually wanted to use. So people just got to think smarter. Don't just think, oh, a calorie is a calorie. It's so not a calorie. 
um, think what your body actually needs, what is going to fuel you for the day and, and therefore eat what your body wants. And trust me, your body wants what the planet provides. It does not want cereal and bread and legumes and the things that the government are trying to get us to eat. It wants yeah. animals. If you can catch it, eat the whole damn thing. And it wants things that grows on the, grow on the trees and, and things that grow out of the ground. And that's about it. And that's what we've stopped eating. That's what we've demonized. So that's kind of eat real food encapsulated. Yeah. Which is so what I take, do. Yeah. Take you back a bit because we've talked about calories. Now, the technical definition of a calorie is the amount of energy it requ is required to, to increase the temperature of one mill of water by one degree C. That's the technical definition of a calorie. That's physics. <laughs> that doesn't apply to biology. And I've never known anyone dis dispel the calorie myth better than you have. And this whole thing with the bomb calorimeter and, and so on. So um, how do you fancy having a go at that? Because oh, I just sorry, think it, yeah, how you do it is just masterful. Oh, thank you. Um, well, yeah, I hope I'm, I'm going to go after it. You're talking about the um, thermodynamics and the. Yeah. OK, right. So yeah. what people say is they say. Um, if you I mean, there is something. I mean, by definition, if you're putting weight on, by definition, you're taking in more calories than you're losing. Right. That that must be the case. No, no, I I actually I don't even know if I believe that because really I yeah, I could. I could remove your thyroid right now. Yeah. And you would gain weight. Yeah. I could put you through the menopause, lols, couldn't, but you can self-identify yeah. as a woman for a few minutes. I can put you through the menopause and you will gain weight. Yeah. And children will go through puberty and they will gain weight. Yeah. And this is where Gary Taubes is coming from. So people never say, oh my goodness, that teenager just grew a foot because he ate too much. Yeah. They say he started eating lots more because he was growing. You know, we have the direction of causation the wrong way around. You eat more when you're growing. You don't, I mean, you do grow because you eat more, but it's, it's this whole sort of iteration kind of thing. You know, do people run up the escalator because they're slim and able to, or is it the slim, are you slim because you ran up the escalator? I run up the escalator because I'm able to. Um, I don't think it makes me slim at all. I think what I do, has absolutely bugger all to do with my size. I think my fitness mate, and I'm not that, you know, I walk, I walk and I do some weights or whatever. I'm really like, what do I need to do to be functionally fit? And that's it. Yeah, I'm not an exactly. exercise junkie at all. Um, mm. So what I'm doing, trust me, is not making any difference to my weight. It, it makes me functionally fit. It makes me feel good. It makes me stronger. It, it, I've got good muscles on that video if people go and watch it. Um, and that's it. What my size is entirely determined by what I put in my mouth and what I put in my mouth, not how much. Um, so let's go back and look at the history of the calorie and the theory behind it. Gosh, so we go back to about the 1900s when you've got um, at water, um, God, who was the other one? Um, at water and somebody or whatever. I mean, they, they were, they, they were trying to, I mean, some of this work actually started in, in America in the early 1900s because they were actually trying to assign value to alcohol. Um, yeah. That was one of the drivers behind this. So, um, you know, when men were working really hard over in America and, and they were trying to, you know, their food shortages and all the rest of it, they were trying to think, oh, well, that we've got lots of stout or whatever they were drinking at the time. Can this help in some way? So they were sticking things, they developed this thing called a bomb calorimeter, which just means you put... Um, a substance in this device and it will tell you you burn it and it will tell you how many calories it's given off and as you said with the definition earlier on that calorie is something that could heat something by a, a degree um, of water so, so this that's... is this is this is the big point i think which is human beings are not a bomb calorimeter no absolutely because absolutely. the bomb calorimeter is based on as you say you get whatever the substances are you burn it in a bomb calorimeter oxidize it and you measure the amount of heat that it generates yeah. right yeah and that's not applicable to human beings and all of this you know uh theory this idea of uh, of the of the assignation of the, of the calorific value of proteins fats and so on is also pretty specious so <clears throat> talk to us a little bit about all of that yeah, so i mean one of the big problems that we've got here is when we're looking at the bomb calorimeter we're looking at energy yeah. And when we're talking about the laws of physics, so I actually challenged a dietitian in a conference. This was back in 2009. I'd been an HR director. 
um, a blue chip organizations working all over the world and thought, right, enough, enough of that. I want to do a second career. Nutrition has always been my passion. I want to move into that. So I went along to one of my first conferences and she'd said something about the laws of thermodynamics in her talk or something. She said, oh, um, it's all about energy in and energy out. And if you put too much energy in or you don't put enough energy out, you're going to get fat. That's basically what she said. And I was thinking, um, you've made a huge leap there from energy to weight. And the laws of thermodynamics don't say anything about weight. So I kind of asked her a question on it and she clearly wasn't prepared to have the question because it was kind of, you know, almost like, what on earth are you asking me anything? You know, this is, this is the Bible. This is how it is. Yeah. And I remember going away afterwards and thinking about it and just, this isn't how it is. So energy is one thing. Now they say, oh, um, there's a law of, of the, the physics, law of thermodynamics, they're interchangeable terms that says energy in equals energy out. Well, there isn't. The first law of thermodynamics says energy shall be conserved. So first of all, it says in a closed system, which is a massive caveat, because that's what you just alluded to. We are not closed systems. In a closed system, energy in and energy used up in that closed system and energy out will balance. But it doesn't mean energy in equals energy out. Um, so I would use the example you put um, energy, let's say you put coal into a power station. So you put a certain amount of coal energy into a power station and you get a certain amount of electricity energy out now the coal that went in weighed tons the electricity that comes out weighs nothing and and yet energy will have been conserved there's also a second law of thermodynamics which is really important which is the law of entropy it's also called the law of common sense and it's also the law that kind of explains um, energy kind of always isn't conserved because we're not closed systems. So you boil the kettle, energy has gone in in the form of electricity, and then you heat up the water. But you've also got a ton of stuff coming out of the spout. Yeah. And that's energy lost. And we lose energy all the time. We sweat, we get warm. Um, we've got products coming in, we've got products coming out the other end. So we are just not closed systems. Now, when I used to um, be a bit more of a, a sugar addict in my 20s, um, my boyfriend at the time used to think it was hilarious. If I if I had a real sort of go at a box of chocolates and I could usually demolish a whole damn thing, um, I turned into a little furnace. So he, he used to literally just go like that and then warm his mm. hands on my face. I, yeah. I, turned, I was just losing heat energy. My body had just decided, you've just put a shed load of carbohydrate in that I've got no use for whatsoever. It was even junk carbohydrate. Turn it out. Yeah, just just I'm going into burn overdrive. It wasn't very pleasant for me. It was like having a hot flush in your twenties. Yeah. Um. So the body just just uses it up. So, you know, energy does not equal weight. So we invented this formula, where we said one pound of fat contains three and a half thousand calories. And I break that down in that presentation, and show that actually we can't even prove that bit. And just by being out, how much we're out could make a difference of us gaining eight stone in a year or losing one stone in a year. I mean, it is worse than useless, yeah. but nevertheless, we made this formula and you'll still see it on the internet. You'll see it in men's health. You'll see it in magazines where they say, Oh, if you cut back by three and a half thousand calories, which is just 500 calories a day for the week, by the end of the week, you will have lost one pound. Oh yep. no, you won't. You just won't. Um, or better still cut back by a thousand calories a day and you'll have lost two pounds oh no you won't and I stand there and say look I'm 110 pounds if I did that over the course of a year I should weigh six pounds in a year's time and everyone laughs and I say why are you laughing yep. that's the formula that you believe if you're good for every 7,000 calorie deficit that you yep. create and you won't you just won't I've just shown you how you can create a calorie deficit and all you do is make your body sicker and you you still have too many calories that the body doesn't want to use. Thank you for listening. And if, before you leave, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our media channels. And that way you won't miss future episodes with our other amazing guests.